So who's starting? I'll start off, I think. I mean, I was um, blown away. What a terrible way to start. I was blown away by your love bomb. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I think one of the things that I found so impressive about it that I'm always uh, struggling to do, I think, in my work is that it's hilarious. It's really funny, and it's always suspenseful. I was thinking we were talking a little bit about negotiating tone. So how do you write? Um, how do you write a novel that is unputdownable? That you're really there's some kind of inexorable gravity. If you read this book, you won't be able to put it down. You actually can't stop reading it. It's hilarious, but the stakes never feel low. I mean, I, I think part of it is that Lisa throws some babies into the mix. I will say what I learned from a craft perspective. If you want to turn like the gas flame heap up on some fiction, Kill shotguns, some babies. babies. <laughs> you have that, you know? Shotgun to the baby. Shotgun plus baby. You're just gay turned, you know. But I mean, I think also just so smart about um, human nature. It's, a, it's such a sort of a brilliant social book, um, in addition to being really satirical, really funny. Is that a question? That's a question. <laughs> yeah, sort of what kind of, well, I wondered a little bit about how, how you how you achieve that. If it's just you're like a super genius and it's intuitive, or if yes, part so of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the question is Sorry. Uh, we should yeah. talk about tone. Yeah. Let's I would, talk I would about love tone. to hear about if, if you do different revisions for sort of like, you know, the, the sad funny ratio or the terror funny ratio. How do you, how you figure that out? Um, is that better? Yes. With it off. That's all. Oh, okay. So we're not in like an echoing chamber of madness. <laughs> we all did mushrooms together. <laughs> I'm always jealous of people who have in their work wars and um, um, people with fatal diseases and sick puppies, like things that everybody's going to feel the same way about. Um, I, I appear to not be very interested in writing that stuff, and I suspect you're not either. Uh, I mean, the only things that interest me have a kind of um, mixed tone, or in, in some sense, you know, you could feel two different ways about them. But um, with this book, uh, it's we're still not allowed to joke about terrorism. Terrorism is very serious, and I just want to say that, that abstractly I'm opposed to it. <laughs> I don't want to personally be shot, nor do I want anybody else to be shot. And I feel like that you decide really. <laughs> but there, there's still the sense that, that you know that it's not something that can be um, the subject of, um, of yeah. comedy. And we, you know, we were talking about. Ben Stiller and Meet the Parents, you know, who says you can't say bomb on an airplane? Bomb, <laughs> bomb, bomb, bomb. And I sort of feel like that was what my mission was, to say bomb on the airplane. And I don't know if you remember after 9-11 when the, the, the New York ran the cartoon that broke down Manhattan by the various neighborhoods. Uh, you know, what were they? It was like they all had names. There was this sense of huge relief that it was okay to laugh again. And uh, I guess I believe very strongly in the power of humor, and so um, I don't know if that's an answer. But um, no, how about, how about, how about, how about your tone, Lisa? Uh, uh, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, uh, could you turn your mic on again, and we'll adjust it down so you're not so echoey. You're just a little quiet. Okay. Thanks. But. What about the adjusting it down? Sugar was <laughs> <laughs> okay. My brother came, he's in the back. Hi brother. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think one of the things that I really admired and connected with in this book is that there's so many gifts given to the reader. I heard Willis Tower say that he always tells his students like you have to think about the gifts you're giving to the reader line by line, you know? Like what, like, and it's such a generous book in that sense, that there's never a line where you're not like actually belly laughing, and you're not terrified for the people involved, and you believe no. that they're real people. Everybody's you know? going to be okay. Everybody. It should come with a label. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's, but, no actual humans were harmed. Which you know, know, I think I read a review where they're like, the, you know, the review was something like, I think because of the humor, who knows what, she's like, you're never worried it's going to be cataclysm, like arson and chaos, but I was the entire way through. And I think as a function of, you know, the narrator's constantly reminding you that 
that motives aside, you know, even if this, this particular terrorist is not malicious, I don't know, accidents happen. You know, there's really kind of a sense that it's, it's very fraught consistently all the way through. And I think I really admired the way. I have a hard time doing that in my fiction, sort of like, you know, setting the clock inside the story um, that's very urgent. So you buy yourself some time to have this keen observational intelligence and humor and all these wonderful other kinds of gifts. Even as someone's like, I'm the baby gonna die. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> Are you sure you think I could afford this? <laughs> Can I make a straight point about terrorism? Um, uh, no. <laughs> the suburbs are not safe. They are not. Uh, things like Aurora happen in suburbs, statistically. Uh, this is just a fact. People, um, it, you know, you need some time to come up with a plan that involves fancy costumes and a lot of artillery. So you don't get drive-by shootings in the suburbs, but you get a lot of weird shit. Uh, so statistically, I just feel like I, I want to point out that suburbs are not what they're cracked up to be. And I feel like I'm, this is my role in life. Um, well, that's such a good segue. So I recently, my best friend in Miami, one of my questions for you, which I then realized was a bogus question was, you know, is it interesting, this, this terrorist character, I think one of the tensions in the book is that she's capable of a kind of intense planning and calculation that seems at odds with the sort of derangement. You know, the, all of the, there are like 50 therapists in the book who are all lobbing diagnoses around. And none of them seem to fit someone who's capable of this kind of canny and really conscious planning. But my best friend, Karina in Miami, was recently a bride. And I have to say, the pairing of insanity plus like OCD planning, I believe it, OK? And I've seen it on the bride side. And I think there's sort of a weird. Uh, and you know, analog there. Um, so I don't know if, if you wanted to talk about that at all. <laughs> your the psychology, right? of, yeah. your yeah. Friend, yeah. I don't the know psychology of this particular you know, how, well, how that kind of. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have had girlfriends who couldn't get over a guy, uh, and couldn't shut up about not getting over the guy, no. and <laughs> saying um, <laughs> he's just not that into you oddly just doesn't work. Uh, and statistically, the amount of time that stalkers hold on to obsessions is 10 to 12 years, which is why it doesn't work. Um, so uh, I knew a couple of these women, and I, I really thought that they could do some very interesting things. Yeah. But how come you never write about statistical stalkers? Why are you writing about <laughs> alligators? And let's talk about alligators, vampires, and women. In this book, there is a story, a kind of amazing story, that starts as a story about um, stolen child laborers in a kind of unknown Asian setting. Or is it just that shit? I, I don't know. <laughs> but the, the twist is that they, they are fed something that they spin the silk out of their own bodies. Uh, and it's a very kind of creepy, especially for you, because I think of you as a woman of infinite good cheer. That's kind. Uh, I mean, I, I thought Swamp, Swamplandia had a kind of melancholy tone, but at the end of it you feel, you know, like things are going to go well. And this seems like a much darker book. Is that true? I do think that's true. I do think that's true. Cats out of the bag, right? And it's always awkward when people know you in the world. But like, Karen, we had such a good time with the Aggies. This story made us pew. <laughs> <laughs> made us so sad. We don't understand. I mean, so totally, right? That's like a, that's a funny sort of tone question, I guess. Um, well, all right, so you're, you're writing, a, there's another story in here about um, horses in a barn, all of whom are dead presidents that of the United true. States. That's um, happy. Okay. That was happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, um, so, all right, let's go back to the women, the, the child, the children sold into slavery whose bodies become machines to, to manufacture silk. Are you laughing when you write that, crying, oh, crying no. through your tears? What is your state you know, of mind? No, it's interesting too. I mean, one of the things. I mean, I really loved. Again, I really, truly loved the way Love Bomb. It's sort of. Um, All right, enough about Love Bomb. But one of the things that I feel less equipped to do lately is sort of that kind of calibration. So in this story, a lot of the editing involved taking out these jokes that I kind of like compulsively, compulsively seated. 
because that's my game in life too. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, um, you want to have some little like, uh, some little like carnival trill or something as uh, things, things went way dark. This is sort of like a Cronenberg sort of story, this industrial horror story um, about these girls who do start to manufacture silk in their organs and have to hook up to a machine. I mean, it was, I was reading a lot about Meiji Japan, industrial Japan, when it's essentially, I think what was interesting to me is like, it's not so far from what actually happened, you know, so. Well, except for the part about them spinning silk out of their bodies. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> well, true. <laughs> it was just that heartburn. <laughs> um, but I think I was thinking a lot about these like hybridized beings, and it felt like a stretch to me actually not to, not to try to be funny about that, right? To try to do sort of like a monochrome to be to be quite serious. This is more like the fly. The, yeah, the this is more like the fly. <laughs> it is more, I think that's true, you know. And that was, um, in some ways, a little bit of a stretch for me because most of the stuff I've written to date has been like a sibling story that at least initially starts out as some like SNL sketch about like what if a wolf was raised by a nun, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like it, 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 it promises humor, right? And this is really. Um, I don't know, no, not a lot of jokes occurred to me, I guess, as I thought about these women and these girls and so. stuff. I don't know, it's, it's kind of exciting too, you know, to, to push on, to push into that frontier. There's something, there's something interesting and good about it, I think, um, about like, uh, it's a different, it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of ratio of humor and sadness, I think, in this case. So. The, the other thing I was curious to ask you about is, is short fiction versus the novel. Uh, maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah, so. I will do so. I had brunch with Lisa after reading Will Follow, and I was like, how? And I would love to, we should we should segue into the structure of this novel. This novel does inside, outside, inside, outside, and it's a really brilliant, it's it's truly brilliant, and I think, um, and it moves consistently throughout. So what was exciting to me about reading Lisa's novel was for a long time now, in my new life, I read a lot of galleys, I get a lot of student manuscripts about like, I don't know, eight page stories about like Cleopatra at the mall. It's more <laughs> difficult than it used to be to just purely enjoy fiction. And it was really interesting from a craft perspective to see the way that Lisa had engineered this book. So the question was so pressing that you couldn't stop reading. I mean, it felt that urgent. And you wanted to stop because the sentences slow you down and the insights slow you down, but you really want to get to the end. Um, I had a really hard time writing Swamp Land yet. Like I had the longest thing I'd written when we sold that book was like a twelve page short story also about alligators. And I think it was just a learning process to figure out how to scaffold, how to keep multiple worlds, kind of how to juggle multiple worlds, um, you know, how to how to keep something that felt magical and realistic and shifting ratios, kinda of how to keep that how to how to prolong this uncanny hesitation or something. That was not Easy, so it was so fun in a way to go back to stories, you know, which feel like my dumb analogy, which everybody hates, but it's just like if you like exited a long, complicated, loving but difficult relationship and had a million flings, like <laughs> just like this, like you know, boozy divorcee, it was like that was weird. On to the next one, <laughs> well, whatever. Like, the stakes were low. Like, we're not at the Benegans. I've never seen him again. Or all the video poppers, I said, knowing I would never see him again. <laughs> it just felt nice that way. You, you know, you make some weird choices, but uh, the stakes are lower. You know, you can take I, different but, risks. But I don't think the stakes are lower in short fiction it, when it's working. Uh, when it's working, sure. Um, and, you know, it, it seems to me that often in a good short story, there's, there's almost um, a lot of the beginnings of your stories, which seem kind of high concept. All right, what if all the horses in the barn were actually dead presidents? Uh, and Roosevelt was in a bad mood and, um, and so forth. They seem very high concept, but, um, but there's a kind of moral imagination to the way the questions are posed. So they're kind of um, questions that you have to answer in this very dense and compressed amount of space. And I can imagine why it would be hard to move to Swamplandia because you were trying to do a similar tone but yeah. over more length. Over oh, much uh, more length. I think it's senses, right? Like I think so much of the joy of writing for me is just making these senses micro pulse. And um, as you know, right, like over the course of like 300 pages, like that kind of density, you have to figure out a different way to maneuver. Um, but 
that brings me to my question. Uh, I would just love to hear sort of a little bit about backstory about how this book came to be and when the, when the structure occurred to you. Because it really is pretty ingenious. But it, and it seems like the way the book is structured, this is something we can talk about too, that made me really irate both on my own behalf and Lisa's behalf. Sometimes when reviewers review novels that you have carefully and meticulously structured so that there will be some payoff for the reader and latter two thirds, you know, like a great gift to the reader, whether they're going to be rewarded for hanging with you this whole time with some kind of surprise. And then a book reviewer will just be like, cool, it really pissed me off when, you know, <laughs> the terrorist turned out to be X, or like the bird man did this thing. And you're like, why? <laughs> so I don't, know if, I don't know if you had that same sort of extreme Kool-Aid man reaction. Uh, just like spoiler alert. Um, I, but I thought one of the great pleasures of the book was that there is this really unexpected turn. Um, all of the victims in this book, this terror shows up, everyone's like, who knows her? Is she with the bride side? Is she with the groom side? It, like, it will feel familiar to anyone who's ever been to a wedding and had like a wholesale disdain of the other person's side, you know? <laughs> Where you're like, I bet it's with the groom side, because our side is not like those, like, you know, whatever. Um, it also magnetizes everybody, the victim sense that they are culpable for this disaster. There's some, and I think, I think in some cases some of the, the people, you know, there's like a lot of sort of like, uh, there's just a lot of hypothesizing about who this terrorist could be. And, and, you know, one of the consequences is lots of like sort of ghost stories from the past, love ghost stories, um, get told and come to the fore. And I was thinking a lot about, you know, how victims want to take a tragedy personally. There's, it's somehow so much more comfortable to say that I am the catalyst or I'm the agent than to say this is a random act of violence potentially and I'm a nobody, I'm fungible, I'm some fungible brunette or whatever. So that's anyway. what they were saying at the wedding, I'm some fungible brunette. <laughs> <laughs> Just those words. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is a really long-winded way of asking, how much of the story did you know in advance? Did you know who the terrorist was in advance, or was that something that you discovered writing the tale? How did the um, structure? Well, I'll just say that? I'm not annoyed. I mean, reviewers giving away the ending just seems dumb to me. They're but, dumb. But <laughs> I, I do hold with Hitchcock's distinction between suspense and surprise. And, uh, you know, if you can, what's the movie where the guy's a ghost who's Bruce Willis? Six, six, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so it's I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Alzheimer's is setting in. I mean, can you watch that again once you know he's a ghost? Sure. Yeah? I, I mean, in my opinion, it, it, it's kind of over at that point, but Psycho is never over for me. You watch the beginning of Psycho, you know the woman's going to die, you know the woman in Notorious is going to break the bottle with the uranium in it, and it feels worse leading up to it knowing what, what the person is. So, I, you know, I, I'm not really, it, if knowing who the terrorist is, and we're incidentally supposed to call her the HT or the hostage taker. Uh, and uh, Ray Iglesias, who's sitting there, who's a, a very good screenwriter, told me, why don't you just not call her a terrorist at all? It'll make your publishing life much easier. <laughs> uh, and I think he might have been right, but hostage taker. <laughs> what would taker, you have called her? Uh, that bad bitch. Like, <laughs> HT. You know, hostage taker. Uh, but the novel used to be called The Terrorist of Love. That was my first uh, title for it. Do you like that better? No. Good. Uh, but I did, I did not... I did not know who she was. She okay. had the gas mask on. Okay. I had no idea why she was doing this. And um, therefore, I did a lot of stutter stepping trying to figure it out. And early drafts of the novel had large set pieces about her socks as I waited to figure out what the hell was going on. You know? so, <laughs> it really did take me a long time. And I interviewed uh, about 15 psychiatrists trying to figure out, you know, it, I, love, I love diagnosing imaginary people with psychiatrists. It gives me great pleasure. I want it to be my new day job. <laughs> I just want to go to shrinks and say, you know, I, I, I feel very attracted to X and then just start being diagnosed on imaginary illnesses, which is what novel writing is in, in a certain sense. But uh, the problem was who would do this and why? And it took me a really long time to figure it out. And then I had to kind of comb out a lot of the, uh, with the help of my brilliant editor, Sarah Crichton, I had to comb out a lot of the stuff that was kind of irrelevant to the story that was being told. So I didn't know. 
Okay. Um, when did when did it kind of come into focus? Or? Well, um, I did an obscene amount of research on um, SWAT procedures. Uh, I mean, really an unconscionable and useless <laughs> research because there's a certain point where anybody who's a writer who can, can tell you, you're just avoiding the work. You know, I have to go out and like, um, uh, you know, I was at a writer's colony calling the SWAT guy and saying, how much does the throw phone weigh? Uh, how do you get it to the window? Does How high is the retractable arm of the thing that gets the phone to the window? And, you know, it's like I couldn't imagine this without knowing all this, but it was through that research that I figured out who this woman was. So I guess it wasn't really useless in the end. Did you but meet anybody? Did you go on any like SWAT calls? Like, I did. It, it was again? such fun. <laughs> uh, I, you know, if uh, it, I really, I would like to be, I would like to be a um, a detective or a, you know, wouldn't we all? It's like CSI, you know, who needs a day job? You know, <laughs> give me a corpse and I will figure out what's wrong with the corpse. Um, you know, even though I can't even look at a paper cut, you know, which is going to be a disadvantage. But um, I did, I did go on some SWAT training missions, and I guess one of the things that fascinated me about it is that it's nothing like on CSI. Uh, and, you know, this is a novel that's, that's kind of wildly unrealistic in some senses, because she's got on this get-up and so forth, but, you know, I mean, starting with the fact that, uh, and you, it, Rafe, you can correct me on this, you probably know more about police procedure than I do, but nobody's jackets say SWAT. I mean, that would be like, <laughs> and SWAT is just the word for, for the kind of activity, like they say tech or they say, you know, whatever the acronym is, but it would be like if you had a bride and her dress said bride. You know, they just don't, don't do that. And they're always bursting through doors with no planning. So I sort of felt like if I could get all that right, I'd know the psycho psychological reality of the book, which was, by the way, just not true. It had nothing to do with it, but it was fun. Thank mm -hmm. you.